our uh, special lecture session, the labor market and macroeconomic policy, is there an anti-worker bias? Uh, our uh, special lecture session speaker is Dr. Ayantul Is uh, Islam, Professor, Griffith Asia Institute, Griffith <coughs> University, Australia, former branch chief, ILO, Geneva. Uh, I would like to give a short uh, uh, bio description of Dr. Ainatul Islam. Uh, he is a, a director level appointment at the International Labour Organization, Geneva, Switzerland, with supervisory responsibility as chief, the Employment and Labour Market Policies Branch, Employment Policy Department, ILO, Geneva. He was responsible for leading, coordinating, and managing the work of over 40 staff. He is now adjunct professor, Griffith Asia Institute, Griffith University, Brisbane, Australia. Uh, I humbly request uh, Dr. Yanutul Islam, sir, uh, to take his uh, position in the podium. Now, uh, I would like to introduce our uh, chair of this session, Dr. Rizwanul Islam, former special advisor, employment sector, International Labor Office, Geneva. Uh, I would uh, like to uh, give a short uh, description about our chair. Uh, Dr. Rizwanul Islam is former special advisor, employment sector, uh, ILO office, Geneva. During his career with the ILO, he has held various directional positions. He is visiting professor at the Institute for Human Development, Delhi, India, and visiting senior research fellow at the Research for Policy and Development Institute, Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. Prior to joining the ILO in 1980, he was an associate professor of economics at Dhaka University. I would like to request uh, Dr. Rijwanul Islam, sir, uh, to take his seat on the podium. And uh, I am inviting Dr. Ainatul Islam, sir, uh, to give his uh, special lecture. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, first, I would like to thank Sanem for inviting me to chair this very important session where Professor Yanatul Islam will be delivering a special lecture. So without any further ado, I would like to call upon Professor Islam to deliver his lecture. I suppose I'm told he will take about 30 minutes or so. And after that, we will take a few questions, and uh, probably he will answer, if not all, at least some. Uh, and then, at the end, I will keep a few minutes, if you don't mind, for myself to say a few words. Okay? Thank you very much. Jan? Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, good afternoon to all of you. It's always a pleasure and a privilege to uh, participate to participate uh, in a Sanem conference, which, in my humble opinion, has become an intellectual milestone, uh, certainly uh, for Bangladesh. Um, the topic is about uh, the labor market and macro policy. But before I go ahead. Uh, I would like to uh, record my appreciation of the hospitality and generosity of Professor Selim Rehan and his wonderful team of organizers uh, and, and for giving me this opportunity to share my ideas with you. Uh, as you can see from the title, it's uh, an attempt to revisit the labor market. It is an attempt to say that as currently constituted, the labor market, even as it presents itself and manifests itself through macroeconomic policy, has 
an implicit an implicit anti-worker bias. So I emphasize the word implicit. Nobody does it by design. I mean, so the way you work out certain theories and their logical deductions, it leads you to certain conclusions which then implicitly uh, can impart a certain kind of bias. And that's my point. Uh, I'd like to make some acknowledgements as far as the writing of this paper is concerned. It first of all draws on collaborative work with uh, an ILO official, Mohammed Avi Hussain, who is uh, attached to the Bangladesh office and is now seconded to Fiji. Avi, I believe, uh, Salim, was a student and staff of yours. Yeah, excellent. So, uh, so um, uh, I did the work uh, with, with Avi. Uh, it also draws on a background paper prepared for ILO Geneva, which I completed in December 2023. Uh, it builds on a, a journal article that I did uh, also last year. And what I do is um, I, I have this hobby of collecting citations. Citations from famous people. They could be singers, they could be poets, they could be economists. And these citations reveal a lot, uh, because in my view, uh, the citations I've selected capture the substance and spirit of the paper very well, better than I can in my own words. So I will start with Adam Smith. Now Adam Smith is of course the intellectual godfather of the market economy, the intellectual godfather of Western capitalism. But those who have studied Adam Smith, and I have not carefully say, that he had many critical observations to make about the failings and the limitations of the market economy. And one of them is reserved for employers, who he called masters. Now just imagine his language, employers are called masters. He says, masters are always and everywhere in a sort of tacit and uniform combination, not to raise the wages of labor above their actual rates. So that's Adam Smith from The Wealth of Nations. I don't know whether you listen to Johnny Cash. He's one of my favorite singers and a very well-known singer-songwriter. And here is this lament about the indignities of manual labor, about the distressing conditions that people with low skills have. And he writes, which is a part of his famous lyric, you load 16 tons, what do you get? Another day older and deeper in debt. That's a Johnny Cash, which basically is saying, well, as a low-skilled manual worker, I don't get paid enough, and I find myself becoming less healthy and poorer. And this is from David Card. David Card, as uh, those of you who follow uh, Nobel Prize winners, in 2022, David Card received the Nobel Prize for economics, in particular in the area of labor economics. So here he is saying the following. By insisting that markets set wages, labor economists seeded the field. So he's basically feeling rather sad that his fellow economists have simply um, have abandoned the field by saying, well, there's nothing to say about wages because the market said wages, so I, we don't have anything to say. And indeed, he says, they had very little to say. So these are the kind of sentiments that permeates the paper that I hope I can share with you. Let me give you a bit of an outline. First, I'll talk about, by the way, can you see the print? Is it too small or can you read? Can you read from the back? Okay, so it says, I want to start by saying that, you know, the, the, the macro policy issues that we read in textbooks and that we are taught in class, even uh, when I learned as both as an undergraduate and as a graduate student, actually has something in it, which is the perfectly competitive labor market. It's not explicitly stated, but that's what it is. And I view the perfectly competitive labor market as a normative benchmark, as an aspirational vision of where the world ought to be 
rather than where the world is. So therefore, I'm going to focus on deviations from this normative benchmark. Why is it that real world labor markets deviate from the perfectly competitive normative benchmark? And there are two ways of explaining it. There, there can be many ways of explaining it. I try to explain it in two ways. One is what I call the worker power theses, or WPT. The other is what I call the employer power theses, or EPT. And there I discuss some evidence, policy options, and finally, after all, I'm giving this presentation in Dhaka, and I would be remiss in terms of my responsibility. And also, um, doing injustice to my heritage as a Bangladeshi, not to be able to say something about Bangladesh. Um, I'm not an expert on the Bangladesh labor market, and I rely heavily on the work of my fellow author, uh, Mahmoud Dabi Hussain. So, if you go back to your textbooks, I, I believe there are quite a few students in economics here. Can you raise your hand? Quite a few, quite a few, okay. Selim, you're no longer a student of economics. <laughs> and and the f you know, one thing we, we learn is the so-called new neoclassical synthesis. And in the new neoclassical synthesis, which is supposed to be the consensus in macro, you will recall the aggregate supply curve is vertical in the long run. Another way of saying it is that the, the expectations augmented Phillips curve is vertical in the long run. The two are just different ways of saying the same thing. And the economy settles at full employment with price stability. Now we've entered the world of nirvana. Why? Because there is no involuntary unemployment. There is no child labor. There is no working poverty. There is no forced labor. There is full equality in the workplace because workers and employers have equal bargaining power. There is no problems of safety in terms of working conditions. There is no Rana Plaza disaster that can ever happen in a world like this. So that is the world that inhabits macro as we know it. And we know that in this world, there are forward-looking utility maximizing agents who operate in an environment of full wage and price flexibility. This is the long run. Now, as Keynes rudely reminded all of us, in the long run, we are all dead. So if we are all dead in the long run, we need to be able to work out what is happening in the short run. That's where the interesting um, aspect of analysis begins, because if you cannot resolve the short run, we cannot go to the long run. And that's where I think interesting things happen. In the short run, we say that the economy is characterized by nominal rigidities. And these rigidities impede the efficient working of a market economy. Internal and external shocks lead to durable deviations from full employment and price stability. And because we have rigidities, we are unable to return to full employment quickly. Hence, we need macro policies, monetary income exchange rate policy and fiscal policy. And that combination leads to, OK, I'll let the chair switch off his <laughs> mobile phone. OK, so what are the recent examples of these interventions? You'll recall the global financial crisis of 2008, 2009, recent enough for all of you to remember. And of course, we all remember the COVID-19 recession. And there, certainly, those interventions took place and were effective. That's what we know. So, but, and this is where the big but is, what else can we do? All economists who work in this tradition agree that in the long run, you need to remove the nominal rigidities so that the economy becomes more flexible. So when you're able to have a policy framework in which you are removing or at least alleviating nominal rigidities and combine it with the, the other aspects of interventions in fiscal monetary policy, then you have a way of making a market economy more efficient and moving towards 
the perfectly competitive benchmark. Well, <coughs> what are the causes of these rigidities? That's the next question. And there, the culprits are minimum wages, strict hiring and firing rules, regulations concerning overtime and work hours, generous social welfare benefits, affirmative action to deal with discrimination, so on and so forth. In other words, anything that smacks of social welfareism is suspect. Why is it suspect? Because we believe, or people who believe in this framework say, that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. All these policies have good intentions, but they have bad, unanticipated consequences. And that is why we should really get rid of those or reduce them as much as we can. What happens when there are nominal rigidities? There's involuntary unemployment, persistent voluntary unemployment, working poverty, all the maladies that we associate with real world labor markets really stem from the presence of these nominal rigidities that are engendered by this social welfare framework that we talked about. So the correct course of action is to remove the rigidities. Now you might say I'm making this up. Surely no economist seriously believes in this. I don't know whether you've come across a couple of papers. One is by Basley and Burgess on India, 2004. Another is by Botero, which is a global application of the same framework. Those two articles have had 5,000 citations. And if they weren't saying anything interesting, why would they be cited 5,000 times? So they became influential, as did a number of other related studies. I'll give you one more example. How many of you have come across in your, in your undergraduate or graduate work, Harris Todaro? Harris Todaro? A few, okay. The editors of the American Economic Review, Harris Todaro was published in 1970 or 71. The editors of the American Economic Review have said that in their judgment, the harris todaro model is one of the most influential papers ever written over a period of 20 years. Is that influential? Go back to harris todaro what does it say? It says urban unemployment in developing countries is due to excessively high minimum wages. And because those minimum wages cannot be reduced, that's why the unemployment rate persists. So the first best policy action is to remove the minimum wages or bring it down to the market clearing level. So here's the example from Harris to Darrow. The another one is Ertha Lewis. Ertha Lewis, real wage constant model with unlimited supplies of labor. Years later, when Ertha Lewis reflects on these famous papers of his, he says he feels terribly sorry that his work, his paper did not really uh, bear fruit simply because of these institutional impediments like minimum wages and so on and so forth in union power and, and, and pro-labor legislation that has caused these problems. So this is a very influential strand of the literature, subscribed to by many people, many economists, many agencies, even today. But is there an alternative explanation? There is. And I call it the employer power thesis. Now, I don't know how many of you sat through that political economy panel session where Professor Rahman Soban and, and others were there, and they were talking about Bangladeshi capitalism and so on and so forth, you know, the business lobby. Well, here's the story coming up. The story actually <coughs> begins very much with Joan Robinson. In the 1930s, Cambridge economist Joan Robinson proposed a theory of monopsony that leads to radically different results from perfect competition. Basically, employers have bargaining power over workers. There is no equality in the workplace. There is wage suppression. Workers are paid less than their productivity. The economy settles at less than full employment. These are results from her 1930s book. And more recently, a group of authors have argued that growth can be reduced because of reduced returns to education as a result of wage suppression. So we need policy intervention to curtail employer power and not 
just worker power. For that, we need evidence. And the evidence has now been revived in a mid-2000s literature. For many, many years, um, uh, the monopsony-oriented literature was neglected. Ashenfelter, who is a very well-known labor economist in the US, counted that in the 80s and 90s, probably less than five papers uh, actually uh, talked about monopsony. And so it was really badly neglected for many years. Perhaps because, perhaps because, that's my speculation, Joan Robinson was a left-wing polemicist. She hated conservative economists with all her passion. And because of that, I think she was ignored uh, by, by a lot of people for quite some time. So what is the evidence? It is established in many ways. Established in many ways. Um, one of the brilliant insights of one of the leaders in this field is given by Alan Manning. Alan Manning is the London, at the London School of Economics. He did some pioneering work in 2001. He put his results together in a 2005 book published by Princeton University Press. And he says, think about it. In a perfectly competitive labor market, the firm-specific labor supply is horizontal. In other words, the firm-specific labor supply is perfectly elastic, which is why the, the, the firm, the individual firm, is a wage taker rather than a wage setter. So if empirically we're able to establish that the labor supply curve facing a firm is not infinitely elastic, it's actually positive, and the values are fairly moderate, then we have evidence of monopsony power. And that is how the literature really started. Uh, there is one study uh, from 2020 that looked at 1,300 estimates from 53 studies and found in, in just about every case firm-specific labor supply elasticity was positive in the range of seven or two or five. And that leads you to estimate what's known as the wage markdown, how far wages deviate from labor productivity. And they found that the wage markdown can be quite substantial. That's what they found. So that's this one kind of study. And then there was this correlation between uh, employment concentration and low wages. For example, if you are going to work for uh, the banking sector and you find, if purely hypothetically, there are only two bankers that are employers, then those bankers and employers have a lot of bargaining power over you and they can dictate where wages are set. So that's the way the, the various studies have been done. I come from Australia, that's where I'm based, and there's a big debate in Australia about wage suppression, deliberate underpayment of wages. Some people are so upset, they call it wage theft. Think of a rich country actually committing wage theft. And that affects 13% of the working population. That's quite a large number. And there are artificial impediments to labor mobility. I don't know whether you know this, but if, you, uh, if, if you've heard of workers who work in the Middle East, they would work under a kafala system. A kafala system is that an employer sponsors you with a visa, and you cannot move from one job to the other. You're stuck with the employer how horrible the employer might be. In the US, there are actually employment restrictive practices where you cannot shift from one job to another in the same industry very quickly. To the extent that the American court system is now trying to make them illegal. So all of these practices are happening all the time. And there are also estimates of wage price spirals. I mean, the idea is that workers are bargaining power, they raise wages to compensate for inflation, and then uh, employers find themselves in a defensive position, and they pass on those higher costs, wage costs to in the form of higher prices. There's very little evidence of wage price spiral, uh, according to a study by the IMF. If you look at the macro effects of wage suppression, they're quite staggering. From the US, one study finds that the income share of labor declines by 17% in a simulation model, and GDP declines by 13%, also in a simulation, fully specified structural model. These are really big numbers that one ought to, what to or worry about. So, and we can go on and on, but to me, and to all of us, sitting in Bangladesh, which is a classic developing lower middle income country, the most important evidence is employer power 
is much more significant in developing countries than in developed countries. Capitalists in developing countries are more effective and rapacious in many ways than developed countries. How much? We have some estimates. And that's what I want to show you. The wage markdown, that is the, how far wages are below productivity, is 55% on average in low-income countries, and it is about 23% on average in high-income countries. If, according to the authors, authors, we could raise everybody's wage to the pro productivity determined level, then GDP would increase by 69%. That's a massive hit, a massive dividend. Admittedly, these are simulations. They give an indication of the kind of losses that the average worker suffers as a result of the application of employer power. So what do we do? Well, we also find that if you are someone with low educational attainment, you are a much higher chance of becoming a victim of employer power. If you are a woman, you are much more likely to become a victim of employer power. So there is a lot of differentiation across the board. Male members of the workforce are able to do better than female members of the workforce. High skilled workers are able to do a little better than low skilled workers. And the explanation is done through the lens, through the prism of employer power. Okay. What do we do? One thing I learned when trying to read this literature, which I discovered recently, is that none of the authors have ever worked in the ILO. I know it sounds funny, but I'll tell you why. Nor do they know anything about the ILO. And you can say, why? Simply because you are a former ILO employee? Yes, simply because I'm a former employment, ILO employee, and so is my chair for the session today. And to us, it now seems pretty clear, at least certainly to me, that the presence of employer power justifies the long-run policy advocacy that the ILO has been doing ever since its creation decades and decades ago. And what does the ILO say? It says, if you do not strengthen labor market institutions, then workers will lose out. They didn't talk in terms of employer power, but that is what the implication is of the advocacy of the ILO. And that is sadly something that is neglected in the literature because all these American economists and the British economists who are writing on this are completely oblivious. They think the ILO is a soft outfit run by trade unions. What do they know? But basically what they are now saying is basically what the ILO has been saying for many, many years. So this is what I'm going to highlight in a tabular summary of policy options. If I ask you a question, do you know what are the fundamental principles and rights at work? Maybe you'll probably shake your head and say, no, I don't know what the fundamental principles and rights at work are. Well, basically the idea is and are you, I'm just a bit concerned. Can you read the print at the back? No, you can't. Then listen to me. <laughs> basically, I can't read it from the screen here, I must say. Uh, basically, what it says is that there should be freedom of association. Freedom of association. And the right to collective bargaining. That's what it says. And it says there should be the elimination of child labor and forced labor. There should be elimination of discrimination in employment. There should be a safe and healthy working environment. Across those, the ILO has over time developed various conventions which are now called fundamental instruments and all member states of the ILO, 188 of them, have ratified all those instruments and conventions. They've ratified them in 1998 and again in 2020. 
2022. So the idea is really to say we should have a regulatory framework that is internationally agreed that accepts that there is unequal bargaining power among employers and workers and we should therefore level the playing field. We should be able to ensure that women get their fair share of wages. We should be able to ensure that children should be in school, not in the work fail, workplace. We should be able to ensure that people work in fairly safe and healthy working environment. So that's, that's, uh, that's what's happening. And then uh, there's minimum wages, there's uh, uh, comprehensive social protection, and a whole host of policies that can be enacted. But the key advocacy of the ILO is do not assume, as the textbooks assume, that there's equality in the workplace. If you do not deliberately level the playing field, then workers will always get a raw deal. That is the key message. And that, that is what I want to say. And in my view, the monopsony power-centric literature justifies the ILO's position very clearly. Chair, how am I doing in terms of time? Uh, five, minutes. five minutes. And the five minutes I'll reflect briefly on Bangladesh. Now, I'm not trying to pretend that I'm an instant expert. I draw on the work of my colleague, Avi. First and most importantly, um, the structure, think of the structural features of, of the um, Bangladesh market, labor market. One way of measuring how regulated a labor market is, is an indicator that the ILO has devised called EPLEX, E-P-LEX, Employment Protec Protection Legislation. And the EPLEX varies from zero, no regulation, to one, maximum regulation. According to the estimates, Bangladesh is a, not a heavily regulated labor market. The value of EPLEX is 0 0.35. The value of EPLEX is above 0 0.5 in Philippines, Vietnam, and above 0 0.4 in India. So it is not by any stretch of imagination a heavily regulated labor market. Bangladesh has ratified almost all the conventions. But can you guess which conventions it has not ratified at all? Those pertaining to healthy and safe working environment. Despite the Rana Plaza disaster, there has been pushback for a long time now not to ratify those conventions pertaining to the guaranteeing of safe and uh, healthy working environment. That is where the challenge is. And a complaint has also been lodged by the union movement with the ILO in 2019 that the business lobby is resisting proper, proper compliance of freedom of association and, and, and right to collective bargaining in the workplace. There's insufficient social protection, we know that. There's negligible coverage of collective bargain agreements, we know that too. There's a high degree of informality. Now correct me if I'm wrong, the ILO estimates I have are only from 2017. Apparently 95% of the Bangladesh labor market is informal, apparently. 2017, Salim and others who work on it, you can cor correct that. If you have 95% of the workforce, let us say even 90%, then, then it's very difficult to, to actually engage in effective compliance of labor regulations. And you may or may not know that Bangladesh has the lowest minimum wage in South Asia. It's miserably low. It's equivalent to destitution. And it is one of the lowest in the world. A few countries like Rwanda have lower minimum wages. The Bangladesh is certainly one of the lowest in, and, and strikingly low relative to South Asia. I'll show you some numbers later. And we know also that average real growth of minimum wages has been negative for the last 10 years. And average wage itself has been negative for the last 10 years. And there are continuing concerns about a safe and healthy work environment. Here are some figures that I want to show you. So you can see where Bangladesh is. It is less than Bhutan, India, Nepal, Pakistan, just about any country. $45 a month is well below the poverty line as far as I'm concerned. And let's look at, oops. Let's look at the last graph and I'll finish in uh, just a couple of minutes. 
the, last, uh, the graph here on the right hand side is basically saying that the average worker in Bangladesh in 2021 is no better off than she or he was in 2011. And when I saw that number, I said, does it not expose the dark underbelly of Bangladeshi <laughs> capitalism? Isn't it a disappointing feature that despite labor productivity growth of four, five, six percent, despite rapid growth of six percent, the average worker has not gained really anything in terms of real income. When we talk about, you know, you come here, whenever I make my visits, they'll say, oh, it's so difficult to get a domestic servant. They charge so much. It's so difficult to get a driver. They charge excessive wages. Well, even those wages probably do not compensate for inflation, which is why the average wage is actually today no higher than it was in 2011, and it has apparently <laughs> fallen. Now, you can, those who are work on Bangladesh labor market will be able to challenge those numbers. I cannot defend them because I'm relying on my, relying on my co-author who would have compiled it from uh, the original sources. So let me then conclude. I'm concluding that the employer power thesis is both intellectually and empirically more appealing than the worker power thesis. And I'm therefore saying that there is an obligation on the part of the economics profession to pay heed to this piece of evidence and accordingly advise governments on what they ought to be doing. And they should therefore refrain from an unconditional embrace of labor market reforms that may paradoxically end up weakening labor institutions even further to the detriment of the average worker. With that note, I seek your permission and the permission of the chair to conclude my presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jan, uh, for a very absorbing uh, lecture. Um, very inspiring, I would say. Uh, certainly to uh, me personally, and I hope to the audience here, and to the economists. I don't know whether there are any representatives of policymakers. Certainly uh, a lot for policymakers to ponder about. Um, with the permission of the organizers of this seminar, if I may change the sequence a little bit uh, of the chair making his remarks, because while listening, uh, sorry, can you hear me properly? Because it seems to be making some noises. Huh? Yeah. Shall I hold it? Is it better? Because while listening to the lecture, I felt that I have a few remarks to make on which uh, Jan may wish to make uh, some observations as well. So if I make it at the end, he will not have that uh, opportunity. So it will not be very fair. So I will very quickly, in a kind of telegraphic manner, make a few observations and then uh, 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 ask you to uh, raise your questions. First, of course, on the very basic uh, objective of his paper, of his uh, presentation, uh, he was mentioning that macroeconomic policy making inflicts an anti-worker bias, not necessarily by design. I would like to add that uh, if not by design, certainly by negligence and by conveniently overlooking and even working in collision with uh, the employers and capitalists. So that is a, an observation that I would like to uh, leave for his uh, reflection. And as illustration, I will only cite one example, and that's from this country, although I know that this is a seminar where there are representatives of other countries. If you remember the wage setting process that took place, I think in 2023, last year, for the ready-made garment industry, and the manner in which uh, uh, the workers' interests 
were uh, suppressed, uh, not just by the employers. I would tend to say, uh, in, in combined with uh, the uh, with uh, uh, the intervention of the government. So that's uh, the first observation that I would like to leave. So it's not just negligence, uh, it's it not just design, but negligence, even collusion between the two uh, other partners. Uh, the second observation, yes, macroeconomic policies also can create a bias. And here, I would like to cite uh, the complete absence of employment and labor market considerations in macroeconomic policy making in Bangladesh. In fact, if you go to the website of the Bangladesh Bank, which is the central bank of the country, you will see a mention of employment somewhere in the historical document. But I don't think we have ever heard any recent top policymaker, uh, at least of the central bank of this country, uttering the word employment. So it's not just, uh, 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 just negligence, it's a little more. So I would like to uh, uh, touch upon this and even make a plea that please go back to your original mandate and see if a balance between considerations of flexibility, stability, macroeconomic stability, flexibility in the market, which we often talk about, and protecting the basic interests, not just major interests, basic interests of the workers can be achieved in some way or the other. And there, I would like to, my last point on this, to my fraternity, now I'm talking to the economists. Please go beyond the conventional framework that is received from uh, the conventional theories of macroeconomic stability and see if employment and labor market considerations can be brought in. Uh, in this regard, I would refer particularly to the strong recommendations that are being made or have been made in recent times including today, I mean, when we are talking about uh, that, we should use this instrument, that instrument for bringing back macroeconomic stability. And I don't see any economist talking about employment and labor market considerations. So I would make a plea to our fraternity here. So that's where I would like to stop. And now the floor is open for uh, comments, observations, but in the interests of maximizing participations, I would like to request you to keep your comments and questions uh, to, to uh, very short, sharply addressed uh, uh, to uh, Professor Isla. Thank you. Uh, thank you. First of all, uh, thank you so much because uh, the topic is very close to my heart and also very close to my teaching. And I'm sure my students also benefited quite a lot. Uh, the question, uh, I have two questions, very uh, short questions. So one is like, uh, um, we have seen in s different studies, like uh, after the 2013 Rana Plaza collapse, uh, there has been sort of silent automation and shifting to our substitution towards the capitalist mode of production uh, based on capital. So, and that has been, that has affected like not only the male, but the females also have been more affected. Uh, the thing is like, uh, of course there are threats of 4IR and et cetera, but uh, when there is this uh, automation thing, how we can tag this automation with the minimum wage and other things like uh, not uh, so that the employers don't uh, uh, penalize the worker. And the second point is like uh, when the David Kurt uh, got the Nobel Prize for two, 2022 paper. Uh, so um, 
my, I have one question is, uh, be, uh, we have seen the different result than what we have been taught in, uh, in, the, in the literature, in the books. So is it because of the fact that that is a very empirical thing and that has happened only in the empirical place that he has tested and that will not hold true in the countries like Bangladesh? Or that is because of the fact that, that, that just what you have told that uh, it is basically the monopsony. So is it the monopsony that is actually going on everywhere? If that is the case, then all of the things that we teach or we study in the labor economics related to the uh, <laughs> wage, uh, wage taker thing, that will go away. So which do, from your point of view, which do you think is more relevant? Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yeah, the only reason I'm holding this microphone here is that it allows me to walk a bit, you know? Um, and um, some excellent questions, superb observations that can only be made by someone who knows labor economics inside out. Uh, automation, sadly, well, not sadly. <laughs> well, I don't know whether to say sadly. Automation, in a way, increases employer power. It actually increases employer power automation and therefore probably worsens the bargaining power between employers and workers. That's the problem. So how, we, how, do, we, how do we resolve that is a question that ought to engage policymakers. Now automation may not be extensive across the economy here, but it is extensive in sectors that matter, such as uh, the ready-made garment sector. So what do we do with that? How do we, any policy intervention is costs and benefits, and our idea is to be able to argue how do you contain the costs while maintaining the benefits. And one of the ways in which we deal with automation and its negative consequences is to have a robust social protection system combined with education, training, and retraining. And that's a standard prescription that I subscribe to. Uh, when it comes to David Card, David Card actually did an interview. He said that when he wrote that paper, he became ostracized by his colleagues. They wouldn't talk to him, they wouldn't try and recognize because they felt so offended because David, David, <laughs> because David Card has, David Card, see, even, even the microphone doesn't like what happened. <laughs> so David Card basically said, you know, he had a bruising time emotionally writing that paper. But even he says these days, look, I mean, the problem is that the way we teach labor economics, he even says that in a 2022 uh, article that he wrote for Journal of Economic Perspectives. He says how he wishes that all the findings of the monopsony-oriented literature finds its way into the classroom. Can you imagine? He's basically saying the classrooms are untouched by this literature. And you might say, well, why is this? That's because of inertia. Who is going to write a textbook all over again? I picked, up, I picked up a textbook the other day, a principles textbook by Ben Bananke, former uh, Fed chair, and by Frank. You go to the index, there's not even a reference to monopsony. So Econ 101 students who read Frankie and Bananke will never know what monopsony is, which is pretty sad. So I think that yes, uh, um, uh, if we need to, if we are intellectually honest, we should recognize this literature and actually rewrite the labor economics textbooks all over again. That's what I think. OK. Uh, yes, we can go there and I'll Thank you. Now I will uh, ask the organizers to read out a question that came from the Zoom platform. Because apart from the participants here, there are participants who are uh, joining remotely. So please go ahead and uh, uh, read it out. Thank you, sir. Uh, I'm talking on behalf of Mr. Mahatabuddin. So he said that uh, an excellent presentation from Yan, sir, as always. Uh, just one question. Uh, what you have presented, sir, it looks exactly what Karl Marx said as labor surplus value. 
And as Karl Marx said, it is not possible to have labor surplus value equal to labor value added under capitalist frameworks. I have two questions in this regard. Is there any evidence that this markup value you have mentioned is lower in the socialist countries such as Scandinavian countries or the communist countries like China, Vietnam compared to pure capitalist countries like USA or Australia? Number two question, is it really possible to attain what you suggested under the current capitalist economy system where uh, bourgeois are, bourgeois are highly integrated into the state political economy dynamics like uh, the patron client relationship between the business owners and the statesmen. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I suggest that we take a couple of more questions and a question for the organizers. Uh, do we have to finish at 5.30? Two questions, please. Okay, Jan, one from here and the other. Okay. Yeah, you go ahead first. One at the center. Uh, hello? Not working. Try another. You should change the microphone. Yeah. Hello? Okay. Okay. Uh, I enjoyed the presentation thoroughly, sir. I'm just asking this for my uh, conceptual clarity. So initially we talk about like worker power thesis and like employer power thesis that uh, creates uh, you know like deviations uh, deviations in the you know like labor market right so uh, and then you, you go on to suggest that uh, employer power thesis and that actually, you know, like uh, justifies the ILO prescriptions, which I think are kind of similar to the, you know, like mechanisms that we see under the worker power thesis that, uh, you know, like worker protection, uh, uh, then unemployment benefits, minimum wage, uh, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, if we are to combat uh, employer power thesis with you know like another kind of deviation that is worker power thesis what will be the ultimate result uh, um, on the you know like labor labor market uh, and on the nominal rigidities that we are trying to elevate and i have another question shall i continue uh, okay okay sorry uh, uh, okay. Uh, uh, since, uh, like, we talked about automation, like, uh, that can have, you know, like, labor substituting uh, effect that uh, you've already talked about. Okay. I was wondering okay. if it might have any scale effect on the labor market. That, like, with the, uh, you know, like, expansion of production, you know, like, labor hiring will be increasing. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Thank you. I will buy a question on, like, uh, social protection. Okay. So you talked about that it could be a compensatory mechanism. So we have seen that ILO UN system has been advocating for that long. But not much has happened for countries like us, like in that way. So what kind of social protection are you talking about here? It needs to be clarified. And we have seen that like emergence of discussion on uh, minimum basic income. So are we moving towards that or uh, what kind, I mean like this is a a very tough proposition for countries like Bangladesh and other countries where we have seen that over the last 15 years, nothing has happened actually in that way. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you for these very incisive questions. I will first uh, respond to yours. And Bozdevai, I'll then come to yours if that's okay with you. Um, I think I was perhaps not very clear when I made the <coughs> reference to work apart thesis and employer thesis. The interesting thing is that if you believe in the, the kind of labor economics that I've emphasized, which is through the lens of monopsony power, then you come with policy prescriptions that are opposed to the ones in a worker power thesis. In the worker power thesis where workers are seen as a, as a coddled uh, cohort of people, and sometimes the term labor aristocracy come, pops up, then you would say, no, no, minimum wages are too high, unemployment benefits are bad, a social protection is really not terribly desirable, it makes people lazy, and so on and so forth. Whereas if you believe in the work of, uh, la employer power thesis, you say, well, those are needed in order to redress the imbalances in the labor market. And then it's a matter of evidence, which one is empirically robust. My humble opinion and reading of the literature is that the employer power thesis, which has enjoyed a revival in the 2000s after the 1930s paper of John Robinson, actually is empirically robust. In any country that you come across, the, the wage 
productivity gap or the wage markdown is considerably high. And coming back to Mahatab's point now, it's actually it's higher in countries where social protection is weak. It's higher in countries where minimum wages are not properly applied or uh, correctly uh, specified. It's higher in countries where union movement is weak. It's higher in countries where collective bargaining processes are weak and so on and so forth. So it smacks of US capitalism versus Scandinavian capitalism, if you like. And it's lower in countries where these structural features uh, uh, exist. And so Martha, that's my response to your question. And Marxism. I'm not a student of Marxist e economics, but if you find that there is a similarity between what Marx said and what Joan Robinson and her, and her subsequent intellectual heir said, then you're absolutely spot on. Probably Marx was right in some respects, and he was using a different language to explain the same thing. So that's all I can say. I'm not an expert in Marxist economics, and I cannot say more than that. What's the Social protection, I know you've, you've written on it. <laughs> I've read your paper and used it as well. And sure, um, uh, the various components uh, of a social protection system are many, as you know, unemployment benefits, um, uh, maternity benefits, childcare benefits, old age pension, all of them together. Uh, basically compensation when accidents happen in the workplace and so on and so forth. So all of them together form the social protection system. And in South Asia, in Asia in general, only about 1% of GDP is allocated. Only about 1% of GDP is allocated to social protection. For what it is worth, it is possible to raise it more than that. It's possible. Okay. Uh, no country, I mean, certainly Bangladesh has eno uh, enough fiscal resources to be able to finance it. It just means he has to reallocate. Instead of pampering people who are already well off with all kinds of goodies and subsidies and paying them hefty allowances to maintain a car and so on and so forth, uh, they can be redirected to, to uh, uh, strengthen the social protection system. That's my point. And uh, does that answer your question in a way? Yeah. Uh, okay. okay. That's it. To uh, if I may, for another moment, go beyond my role as the chair uh, to add to the evidence that you were uh, uh, talking about. Uh, if you look at the relevant literature, you will see that the share of wages in the total output of a country has been declining for a large number of countries, developed as well as developing. And this has been found in academic papers as well as in reports by international agencies, including the IMF, Asian Development Bank, and so on and so forth. So there is really strong evidence to support this, that the share of wages in value added for the economy as a whole, as well as for the manufacturing, has been going down. Okay. Any more questions? Just a couple of more questions, very sharply formulated. Mm. So we have to finish off in the next five to seven minutes. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Uh, I have got two questions. Uh, one is on uh, startup ecosystem, and another is on artificial intelligence. Uh, that I have been in startup ecosystem quite for quite some time in Bangladesh. So what I have seen in my experience is that uh, due to lack of startup policies in Bangladesh, still yet to be established. There has been, um, I mean, it's not not quite shared in newspapers or in the media, but it's like uh, since it, a lot of ways, like employers do exploit uh, the, the rights, the, the rights of employees. Uh, but there's also that they do, like in the startup ecosystem, well, what I have seen is that they talk about uh, the share of equity, lack of paperwork they don't give, and in, in many other ways. So my question is that, uh, I mean, how can we actually, like, uh, one is that, uh, is there uh, similar examples in other countries too? Like in US, in Silicon Valley, and some other countries too? And how we can, um, uh, you know, also uh, bring that startup ecosystem in also in, in that uh, to improve? And, and the second uh, question is on artificial intelligence, is that uh, since, from, since last year, uh, we are seeing that there is a fear that it will affect uh, in the next few years uh, that a lot of people uh, is scared to lose their jobs. Uh, 
in many industries. So, uh, sir, my question is that, um, do you think that uh, this, the use of AI can be uh, controlled or uh, uh, getting into uh, in policies? Like I saw that the UK government uh, is on talks. Uh, can you yes. conclude the question, please? Yes, yes okay. I have already. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. The last question, one last question, and very quickly, please. Okay, you have the floor. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, my name is Munam, and I'm an undergraduate student of Department of Economics, University of Dhaka. Uh, sir, from your paper, uh, what I find is sort of a paradoxical situation, if I might use that word, where we are saying that unions, strong unions are holding us from growth, uh, but also a weak union is uh, against the well-being of workers, what I find here. So if there are any suggestions from you to uh, cope up with this situation. Thank you, sir. Thank you. No, I'm fine. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, OK. So I uh, will do the following. I'll respond to the two questions to the best of my ability. And finally, I'll respond to the chair's observations, uh, because that is the least I can do. Um, coming back to a startup, okay, uh, do startup companies end up somehow uh, undermining workers' rights? Is that, is that your question? Sadly, they do. Um, I don't know whether you know this, but um, there is a, have you heard of the term zero contract hours? Zero hours, uh, zero contract, uh, contract. The contract says you can work not at all. We'll, we'll give you a sign a contract with you but you may not get any hours of work, or you may get a lot of hours of work. So only in a market where employers have a lot of leeway can they actually uh, develop those contractual devices. And it happens in Australia and UK, elsewhere. Okay. And uh, there's a very interesting paper by Dubey, who is in the United States, who says even apparently competitive labor markets, online labor markets, like Uber drivers, even they have problems of mobility. They have problems of mobility. They can switch apps. Even they are constrained in what they can do and cannot do. So that's artificial intelligence. The thing about artificial intelligence is that, yes, it, it uh, reduces job opportunities, but it also creates job opportunities. Opportunities well, leads me to the question that was posed about the scale effect. That's the scale effect. Overall, the findings are that the net impact on jobs is positive. That is, you gain more jobs as a result of uh, fourth Industrial Revolution, AI, and so on and so forth, then you lose jobs. Does that mean that we should be jumping up and down with joy? My answer is no. Why? Because, let's go back to basic welfare economics. In basic welfare economics, what does it say? It says, a new out outcome is not a Pareto improvement if somebody loses and somebody else gains. That means there can be no losers. To use the SDG slogan, leave no one behind, is a restatement of Paratian welfare economics in many ways. So that's my point, that the distributional consequences cannot be wished away, simply because in aggregate you have more jobs than losses. That's my point. I hope that I am clarifying that. Coming back to the oh. chairs, coming back to the chair, um, I'll conclude with that if I may. And that is, you know, you are very forthright. You are basically saying, the macroeconomists are doing it either because of negligence, which is bad, or because they collude <laughs> with, the, with governments and employers, which is even worse. Now, I try to be polite. <laughs> I try to say that there is an implicit bias because I believe in the generosity of human nature, and therefore you make mistakes by default rather than by design. So that was my point. Your point about macro couldn't agree more. The mandate, we used to have a situation where full employment with price stability was a given. And now it's all about price stability and very little about full employment. And that, unfortunately, uh, uh, reinforces the implicit, if I can say so, anti-worker bias of macro policy. And I fully agree with you that there should be much more on uh, the employment objective. Finally, and finally, I was struck when I attended the session by Professor Rahman Saban moderated by uh, Professor Ronald Yohan and others, how they're talking about rapacious capitalists in Bangladesh. How they're talking about the way the business lobby groups have captured the political process. 
in such a system, you cannot expect workers to get a good deal. The union movement will either be co-opted or they'll be ostracized and eliminated. You don't have a, a middle option. You either get co-opted and become part of the political process and accept whatever is given to you, crumbs from the table, or you are eliminated. No middle path. That, in my view, is the underbelly of Bangladeshi capitalism. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks again to Sanim for organizing such an interesting session for inviting someone like Professor Islam. And thanks to Professor Islam for giving such a brilliant, scholarly, and absorbing lecture, and then doing this Q&A session in such a lively manner. And thanks to all of you for your active participation. Thank you. <laughs>